Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight, the Equitable Life Assurance Society is going to give you some facts about group insurance, a type of insurance that is important in the lives of 50 million Americans. How important? Well, take the Pan American Petroleum and Transport Company. Its president and chairman of the board of its marketing subsidiary, the American Oil Company, Mr. D.J. Smith, says, Greatly as we regret the loss in the recent Texas City disaster of valued employees to the company and their families... It is comforting to know that group insurance provided for their families. For further information on group insurance, showing just how it can benefit you, be sure to listen in about 14 minutes to a message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, Merchants of Arson. is a nation of 140 million people. And in that number, there are more than 50 million wage earners. Some earn their daily bread in normal ways, working with their hands in factories, driving trucks, or tilling the soil. Others manage to exist because they engage in some bizarre occupation like diving for sponges or riding with smoke in the sky. But of all the various obtuse methods used to make money... Perhaps the least understood is a method used by a certain breed of criminal. This perverse system of garnering a yearly income is managed by those criminals who fraudulently go through the process of bankruptcy. In other words, there are those who make their profit by having a court declare them penniless. They never make the page one headlines and the public rarely hears about them. But like the killers and the thieves who become notorious, these men too are criminals. Tonight's file opens on a quiet tree-lined street located in one of the suburbs in a large eastern city. In the backyard of one of the cottages on this street, an elderly man is expertly hitting a croquet ball through a maze of wickets. Two visitors approach. One of them calls out. Uncle Ed. Hmm? Oh, you know, Chet. Find a couple of visitors? Nope. Uncle Ed, I hate to interrupt your practice, but I'd like you to know Mr. Bedford. He's a client of mine. How do you do, sir? I do. Uncle Ed, uh, me and Mr. Bedford would like to have a little talk with you. Mm -hmm. What about? Business. Not interested. But Mr. Bedford here has a real good proposition for you. I'm retired. Hey, stand away from that wicket there. Chuck, this looks like a wasted business. Oh, no. But he just said... Look, Uncle Ed has retired more times than Harry Lauder. Let me handle him. How? I got a sure system. Never fail. What? Oh, Uncle Ed. What is it? 
Are you uh, positive you don't want the job? Yep. Then would you mind doing me a favor? Yeah, what? Tell me where I can get in touch with uh, Tommy Gillen. Huh? What do you want him for? I want to bring him together with Mr. Bedford. You're going to give that old bungler a job? Who else can I get? You're the only two guys around. Mr. Bedford, don't you let him do this, do you? Well, if you won't take the job, sir, it looks like I have no choice. <clears throat> I'll take it. Swell. What's the setup? Uh, it's a warehouse. Oh, they're tough, boy. Big buildings like that take a lot of work. This is only a two-story structure. Uh, you work with me, Chuck? Sure, be glad to. You know my price, Mr. Bedford? Yes, Chuck told me. You'll be paid immediately after the job. Good. Uh, wait, uh, yeah. when can you do the job? Yeah, when do you want it? Well, could you do it tonight? Mr. Bedford, your warehouse will be nothing but ashes by morning. Chuck. What is it? Bring me some more rags. Sure. There you are. What are you doing with that gasoline? Well, I was going to pour some in that corner. Don't let me handle that. If you get bad distribution, the place burns uneven. I've got my reputation to think of. Here, soak these. Okay, sure. Now, I'll just blind them neatly along this wall here. We want some help? Nope, nope, nope. How much longer will we be here? Well, about a minute. Yeah? This place is empty. What does Bedford want it burned down for? Where's the profit? Well, Bedford runs a legitimate business. Uh -huh. About two weeks ago, he bought 40,000 bucks worth of drugs on consignment. Oh, where are they? Well, he had me move them over to another warehouse as soon as they came in. Oh. Now Bedford's going to say they burned up in this fire and collect the insurance, eh? No, no. He didn't insure the stuff at all. Huh? He's got a much smarter touch. Oh. What? Well, after the fire, he can make the claim that he can't pay for the drugs, that he's broke. So he goes bankrupt and sells the stuff to a fence. Yeah, that is pretty smart. He deserves a first-class fire. We should just about give it to him. Are you all finished? Yep. Now let's get over by the door. You going to light it now? Uh-huh. Get ready to run, boy. Here it goes. <laughs> A few weeks after the warehouse fire in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is at his desk going over a file of correspondence as a visitor approaches. Jim Taylor? Yes, that's right. Vic Norwood. Just got in this morning. Oh, hello there, Vic. Hi. Fine, thanks. Say, hey, uh, by the way, Bill Sweet said to say hello. Oh, hey, that's right. You were in the Salt Lake City office, weren't you? That's nice country out that way. Nice people to work with, too. Yeah, I know. I was in that office for a year myself. Oh, uh, you've been in to see the agent in charge yet? Yeah, it's my first thing this morning. He wants me to work with you on this bankruptcy case, if there's anything there. Well, I'm just going over the file of correspondence myself, Vic. Well, what's the story? Well, we received a letter yesterday from C.J. Crawford and Company. That's a drug house out on the West Coast. Well, how'd they happen to write us? Well, they sold a man named George Bedford $40,000 worth of drugs on consignment about three weeks ago. Now, Bedford's business is here. Oh, I see. There was a fire in Bedford's warehouse right after the shipment arrived. And then Bedford filed a petition in bankruptcy. That's right. How much do we know about Bedford? Well, nothing yet, Vic. Well, have you contacted the fire department for their reports on the fire? Yes, they're sending them over. In addition to that, I'm going to talk to the inspector who covered the fire and interview him. Well, that should help. Those fellows are pretty shrewd. Yeah. Vic, I'll tell you what. You take this file here and read through it, huh? That's the correspondence between Bedford and the Crawford Company. Good. That'll give me a little more background. Mm -hmm. And why don't you check and see what you can find out about this Bedford fellow? All right. Meanwhile, I'll go over and see the fire inspector, and if he thinks there's any point to it, maybe we'll go see what's left of Bedford's warehouse. You'll check back here with me? Yeah, I'll call in by noon at the latest, Vic. And if you've got any dope on Bedford by that time, maybe I'll pay him a visit, too. Uncle Ed. Uh, I'm out here on the back porch. Oh, Alone? Uh-huh. Uh, can I talk to you for a minute? We'll I finish up here. What's all that stuff? Press clippings. About what? Fires. Ones I set. Is that whole book full of them? Yep. A scrapbook. Just scan it if you like. <laughs> this one was a pippin. Detroit. Four alarms. Oh, I'll uh, read it over later, Uncle Ed. I got something to talk 
talk up with you about first. Uh, what? Well, I, I've kind of got the shorts. I, I was wondering if I could tap you for a couple of hundred. You broke? Yeah, real broke. Well, what about the money you got from Bedford? Well, I spent it. So soon? Well, you only gave me 500. 500? Yeah, so well, well, I... Wait a minute, boy, wait a minute. He paid you that measly amount after all the things you've done? Oh, I didn't do so much. Well, you made it possible for him to steal $40,000 of merchandise. Yeah, but he thought the thing up. Well, you've done all the dirty work. He should have cut you in for plenty. Well, look, it's too late for that now. It's I... never too late. Wait. Did Bedford get rid of them drugs yet? No. Then you cut in for 50% of them. By who? By me. Oh, now, look, Unc, how can an old guy like Save you... Save that talk, boy. Save it. Where does Bedford live? On 12th Street. Why? We're paying a call on him tonight. Mr. Taylor, you say you're from the FBI. That's correct, Mr. Bedford. Here are my credentials. I see. Well, what can I do for you? You were the sole owner of the Bedford Company before it went through bankruptcy. Is that right? Yes. We received a letter from the C.J. Crawford Company with whom you did some business. Yes, I purchased quite a bit of merchandise from the Crawford outfit just uh, prior to the fire that wiped me out. Yes, I know. You see, that warehouse was a fire trap, and I could never get any insurance on it, Mr. Taylor. When that Crawford shipment burned, I was wiped out. Clean as a whistle. I went over the fire department reports on that fire this morning. You did? Why? Just checking. And I went to the scene of the fire where the inspector who examined the ruins right after the blaze was put up. What was the purpose of all that, Mr. Taylor? Now, look, I'm a taxpayer, and I'm entitled to know. Oh, certainly, Mr. Bedford. I went over the reports and over the scene of the fire to try and make sure that the Crawford Company drugs actually burned, as you claimed. Are you implying that I'm not an honest man? That's not part of my job, sir. I'm merely checking to make sure there is no fraud connected with your petition of bankruptcy. What was it you want to know? Are you absolutely sure that those Crawford drugs were in the warehouse when it burned down? Certainly I'm sure. I saw them with my own eyes. Why? The fire inspector's report and an examination of the ruins today failed to disclose any traces of tin or of steel rods. Tin or steel rods? Some of the products in that shipment were packed in tin. And every one of the Crawford shipping cases for the past six months have been reinforced with steel rods. There should have been some evidence of those things in the ruins. Mr. Taylor, I gather that you're calling me a crook. I'm not calling you anything. I just came here to ask you some questions. You've asked your questions. You're going to arrest me? No, Mr. Bedford. I don't have anything to arrest you for. Nobody can prove anything yet. If you ever think you can, come back and see me. I'll be right here. All right, sir. Thank you. Just a minute. Hi, Mr. Bedford. Oh, hello there, Chuck. You remember my Uncle Ed? Yes, of course. How are you, sir? I do. Uh, come in, both of you. Go ahead, Uncle. All right. I'm very glad that you stopped by, Chuck. I was about to call you. What for? The man from the FBI came to my office today. What did he want? He asked questions about the fire. I gather that they don't think the drugs were there when the place burned. Oh? I think it might be wise for me to get out of town for a while, which means that I've got to get rid of the drugs as soon as possible. You mean sell them? Yes, You know these men, uh, what are they called? Fences. Get the best deal you can. Uh, Mr. Benford. Yes? Uh, What do you figure on paying the boy for this? Same fee I gave him before, $500. He's not interested. Now, just a minute. This is a matter between your nephew and myself. I'm handling this business now. The job will cost you 50%. What? Right, Chuck? Right. Well, this is preposterous. I'll get someone else to do the job. Yeah, hold on there, mister. Let me point out something to you. Well... I understand that the warehouse you get the drugs in now is rented in my nephew's name. That's right. I arranged it that way. You know what that could mean, don't you? What? Chuck here could take everything. Oh, that's how you're playing it. Mm Mm-hmm. Does the boy get 50%, Mr. Bedford? Yes. Of this. He's got a gun. That's right. And I'll use it, too, Chuck. Yeah, put that away. You'll hurt somebody. Get out of here. Chuck, take that gun away from him. Don't come near me, Chuck. I'll shoot if you do. He won't shoot, Chuck. Ain't got the fortitude. Just walk right up to him. That's it. Uh, keep her away from me. That's it, Chuck. Now, take the gun. Come on, give me that. Chuck, take it. Okay. Give it, no, give it no, to me, no, I no, said. No, let it go. Let it go. What do I do now? That's elementary, son. You've got a gun in your hand. Use it. We will
will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man from Texas City, Texas. Ed, you were in Texas City last April when that ship blew up and wrecked the town? Yes, I was there. And am I lucky to be talking to you right now? 31 of the guys in my plant were killed in that blast. Yes, it was one of America's most terrible tragedies, Ed. Sure was. I don't know what the families of those boys in our plant would have done if it hadn't been for group insurance with the Equitable Society. I understand those 31 families in your company received a check from the Equitable Society totaling more than $300,000. That's right, Mr. Keating. What's more, Equitable paid off fast. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society is a mighty good thing for the employee and his family, and it's just as good for the company, for three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yes, Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits. All in one package from the Equitable Society, without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. Right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work. Now that I've got rid of worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Well, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said. And that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Merchants of Arson. As can be seen in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, the professional bankrupt, the man who makes a living by alleging that he is poverty-stricken, is the true criminal. For his crime contains the very essence of criminality, the taking of something for nothing. That what he is doing is morally reprehensible carries no weight with the criminal. He is not concerned with what his community thinks of him. He is an isolationist who lives in his own little world with his own rules and his own moral code. It is unfortunate that nowhere in that code is there any room for loyalty or compassion But the absence of those things is what makes him what he is, a criminal. He not only has no desire to live by the golden rule, he doesn't even understand what it means when he sees the words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For his motto is different. His motto reads, rob and cheat and steal. Because people are fools. And there's only one real crime, and that is being caught. Tonight's file continues in the local FBI field office where Special Agents Jim Taylor and Vic Norwood are comparing notes on the fraudulent bankruptcy. Jim, I checked on George Bedford every place I could. There's one thing that puzzles me. What's that, Vic? How he ever got a $40,000 shipment from anybody on credit. No, why? Well, the Better Business Bureau has him marked down as a sharpshooter. Every credit rating bureau in town has him listed as a bad risk. Well, that figures, I guess. Oh, I also picked up pretty definite information that Bedford was mixed up in the black market during the war. Oh? He was supposed to control the penicillin black market before it became plentiful. Huh? Nice guy. Making a racket out of people's health. Now, what'd you get on him, Jim? I just received a supplementary report from the fire department on Bedford's warehouse. Well, what'd it say? Well, there is no proof. But there's an awful deep suspicion that the fire was no accident. That the place was empty when it burned down. Oh, what happened to all those drugs then? I don't know, but I've notified every wholesale drug company in town to be on the lookout for anyone trying to sell anything on the list that we got from Crawford. Well, it looks like we're going to have to wait for Bedford to make a move then. Well, I'm there. Oh, I'll get it. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Lieutenant. What? Oh, where? Hmm. What's that address again? 26 12th Street. Yep. Yeah. Right, I'll be right over. It was Lieutenant Jones down at police headquarters. Bedford was found dead in his apartment a half an hour ago. What happened? Shot through the head. Oh? Lieutenant thought it looked like suicide. I'm going right over there. J. 
Kent. Yonk. Yeah, let me have that muesli. Sure. Hey, uh, putting something in the scrapbook? Yep. Another fire? Nope. About Mr. Bedford. Oh, you mean his suicide? Mm-hmm. Hey, that's a good picture of him. Too bad he ain't alive to see it. I should have got it years ago. Them legitimate fellas give honest thieves a bad name. Yeah. Well, I think I'll take a run downtown. What for? I'm going to shop around, see if maybe I can peddle them drugs. Uh, not yet, son. Why not? Uh, too hot. But Bedford's dead. They'll or... still be looking for the drugs. When the time, time comes to peddle them, I'll give you the word. Okay. I think I'll go downtown anyway. Uh, wait a minute. What? Don't leave that cigarette burning there. Things like that could start a fire. Jim, what'd you find out about Bedford? That suicide story looks like a phony, Vic. Why? Well, for a lot of reasons. The living room showed signs of a struggle. There are no powder burns near the wound. The bullet entered at a bad angle. Oh, pick your own reason. I see. And Bedford probably was doing business with criminals who got rid of him when trouble turned up. Certainly looks that way. Yeah, what happened to the drugs, though? I don't know. But if we had any doubts at all, this kind of clinches the fact that the drugs didn't burn and that that bankruptcy was illegitimate. Yeah. You didn't get any leads at all on where Bedford might have hidden the drugs, did you? No, just one. I found a key in Bedford's desk that had a tag attached to it, and on the tag was written an address, 171 Front Street. Front Street? Oh. Oh, I forgot, Vic. You don't know this town very well. Front Street is down in the warehouse district. That might be the key to the warehouse where the stolen goods are. I hope so. I had Wentworth go over and check on it. He ought to be calling back here pretty soon. And what about Bedford's office? Nothing much up there that I could see. The police and Bob Williams came over from our office, and they're going up there now and over his books. Do you have a secretary? Yes, I spoke to her. Have you got anything? She told me Bedford had a visitor who seemed to be able to walk right into the private office whenever he wanted to. What was his name? She never knew. She said he was a tall, blonde fellow, about oh, 26, 27 years old. Excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Lieutenant. He did. Mr. Horton at the Brooks Company. That's first and Main Street? Yes. Yes, thanks. I've got it. Fine. Thanks for the information. Vic, here's our first lead. That was the police. Somebody just tried to sell the stolen drugs to a Mr. Horton over at the Brooks Company. They're wholesale suppliers. Did they catch him? Not quite. They tried to detain him, but he got away. Vic, why don't you hop over and see Mr. Horton? I'll wait for the report in the warehouse. Hey, who's that? Me, Uncle Ed. Oh, Thought you were going to stay downtown for dinner. I was, but something happened. Uh, what? We got trouble. What is it, boy? Well, I, I tried to peddle a drug. You, you what? Uh, look, I told you. I know, I know. So I made a mistake. Uh, what happened? Well, a guy I tried to sell the stuff to called the cops. Uh, what did you do? I ran out. Anybody follow you? I don't think so. I circled the block a couple of times, did some fast turns, and then I went to the warehouse and left the car there. What should we do now? Uh, only one thing we can do. What? Can you get a truck? Sure, rent one. And let's get to the warehouse, load the truck, and head for Chicago. What do we do there? Get rid of the drugs where the heat's off. Where do we go? Get the truck right now. Jim, I got the description of the man who tried to peddle those drugs. Good, let's have it. It was that same tall blonde fellow who hung around Bedford's office. Did he tell Mr. Horton where he had the drugs hidden? No, he didn't. Uh, Horton sent one of the boys out in the office to trail him. You going to call you here when the boy comes back? Yes. I take it you had no luck with the key to 171 Front Street? No, it turned out to be a warehouse, all right, but the key didn't fit any lock in the place. Well, whose warehouse is it? Parker and Gordon. The furniture company owns it. Oh, yeah. No legitimate firm. Oh, excuse me. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, sir, just a moment. I think it's for you. Special Agent Norwood speaking. Yes, son. Just a moment. That boy from Horton's office, Jim. Oh. Go ahead, son. Yes. Yes. That's where you lost him, huh? I see. Well, thank you for the information. Goodbye. Jim. Hmm? The boy followed our spot suspect down 7th Street, but he lost him on the Interstate Bridge. Interstate Bridge? Vic, why didn't I think of that before? What? The Interstate Bridge. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Seventy-one ought to be that next building, Jim. Okay, Vic. Let's park the car right here. Leave your door open, Vic. I'll slide out that side. Right. 
think the best thing to do is try this key I found at Bedford in the office door, Vic. If that doesn't work, then we can try the trucking entrance. Okay. Can you see all right? Yeah, fine. It works. Must be the place. Morning, Vic. Right. I'll turn on my flashlight. Hold it a minute. I thought I heard something. Oh, it's okay. All right, go ahead, flashlight. There's a desk. Do we look through it? No, no time. Jim, there's a door over there. Mm-hmm. Put your light on deck. We'll try it. Right. Appears to be a passage down into the warehouse. Come on. Okay. Listen. Come on, let's see who that is, Vic. Look, it's a truck. And that front door is opening. It's going to drive out. Look at that man behind the wheel, Jim. Looks like our suspect. Yes, I'll cover the truck, Vic. You close those doors. Wait. Hold that truck. Don't move it. All right. All right, come on. Cut that motor and get out of there. Better do as he says, boy. He's got a gun. Looks like I've got a couple of murderers, too. Oh, Vic. Never mind closing those doors. We'll all be driving out of here together. Chuck York and his uncle were given a 10-year term for a violation of the Federal Bankruptcy Act in a federal court. They were then turned over to local authorities who tried and convicted them for the murder of George Bedford. And so, because of the timely intervention of your FBI, another crime was solved. Solved because a special agent remembered when he heard that the criminal had crossed the interstate bridge that there was another front street in another community on the other side of the river. In addition to adding to their total number of successfully investigated crimes, your FBI also added to the total value of stolen goods recovered and restored to their rightful legal owners. For that, too, is part of their job. A job so well done that last year the amount of goods recovered and returned ran into millions and millions of dollars. An amount that was a dividend of good law enforcement paid to you, the American people. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For instance, the president of General Oil Sales Corporation, Mr. O.D. Robinson, writes, The tragic loss of 31 of our subsidiary employees in the Texas City disaster emphasize to our company the dollars and cents advantage of operating with group protection. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that dramatically exposes the battle between honest law enforcement officers and a corrupt political machine. Its subject, anti-racketeering. Its title, The Sinister Shakedown. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis, your narrator was Dean Carlton, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The sinister shakedown on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 
The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If you're a regular listener to this Equitable Society program, you've probably noticed this about the commercial messages. There's no high-pressure selling. Each Equitable Society message is designed to help you, to give you expert advice on home and family security, to keep you abreast of the latest development in life insurance. For instance, tonight our Equitable Society message deals with a type of insurance most people know little about, yet it's important in the lives of one out of three Americans. So, in 14 minutes, listen carefully for interesting information on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Gullible Groom. There's never been a time in the long history of the nation when there was so much money in circulation as there is at the present time. And when you have that situation, it is axiomatic that you will also have a certain proportion of the population trying to get their hands on some of that money illegally. Some criminals will take a gun and stalk the highways, robbing stores or gas stations or people in parked automobiles. Others will break into homes, steal whatever is available, and convert the loot into money through the use of a fence. But there is one special brand of criminal to whom these days are the days of milk and honey, to whom prosperity presents a personal challenge. He stalks his prey carefully and makes elaborate plans to separate the victim from his wealth. But this criminal does not use force. He uses cunning. He is... The Confidence Man. Tonight's file opens in a football stadium in a small college town. The game is in progress. It is midway in the second quarter. The two teams are lined up on the midfield stripe. The ball is snapped. Both lines lunge, pile up. Suddenly, out of the pack, a player carrying the ball seems streaking down the sideline. Is it the 35? The 30, the 25, the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. He's over for a touchdown. Jay, huh? What was that? That was a touchdown. Is that good? Oh, honey, how can you be so stupid? It's terrific. Well, Grace, I've never seen a game before. I thought you told me you used to go to games every week back home. Well, I always went with Stella, so I never looked. Not with either head? Huh? Oh, nothing, honey. Just be quiet for a minute. I want to watch this conversion. What's that? They kick for the extra point after touchdown. Oh. There it goes! Did he convert? Yes, sir. Well, what happens now? State college kicks off. And they start all over again? That's right. That's silly. Hey, here comes Walter. Where? Coming down the aisle. To see us? I guess so. Walter! Walter, over here! Excuse me, please. Excuse me. What, what, what? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please. Excuse me. Well, hiya, girls. Hello, Walter. Hi. Well, how are you enjoying the game? Never mind that. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Who's the man you're with? Oh, well, he's the sucker I'm building up. His name is Herbert Franklin. Has he got money? Oh, loaded with it. Where'd you meet him? Hey, I told you this morning I met him last night at a bar. He thinks I'm an old grad, too. Is that why you're carrying that pennant? Oh, yes, Faye, yes. It's also the reason why I'm wearing this feather, this badge, this school tie, and this horse throat. They're lining up for the kickoff. You'd better go back. Yeah, okay, okay. When do we go to work? I'll be with Franklin in the cocktail lounge at the hotel at 8 o'clock tonight. We'll be there. <laughs> Oh, 
Fly your Santa Bulls to you. You are always right. So, on you go, on down the field and fight. Fight, fight. fight. <laughs> oh, Herbert, you've got a magnificent voice. The best voice in this whole saloon. Oh, well, Walter, I, I love to sing, but I, I don't get much chance. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't tell me that. To sing as gloriously as you do, a man has to get plenty of practice. No, no. No, really, Walter. I never get a chance to sing when I'm home. Emma doesn't like noise. Emma? Didn't I show you her picture? Oh, no. Well, wait, wait. Here it is. Here, that, that's Emma and the kid. Oh, hey, fine-looking woman. Yes, she is. And those husky youngsters. Why, why they're going to be football players. I certainly hope so. Oh, pardon me. Yes? Uh, aren't you Herbert Franklin? Why, why yes. Well, don't you remember me? Well, I, I, I remember your face, but I... Oh, we met in New York when you were there last April. My name is Grace Carter. Well, I was in New York last April, but I... Well, Herbert, know. Herbert, what's wrong with you, man? Where is your old state spirit? Invite the ladies to sit down. Oh, yeah. Please pardon me. Will you join us? Oh, surely. Uh, Mr. Franklin, this is my friend, Faye Madison. I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Madison. How do you do? Uh, Miss Carter, Miss Madison, my old chum and classmate, Mr. Roberts. Well, how do you do? How do you do? It's always nice to meet any of Herbert's friends. Uh, sit down, sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you. Hey, waiter, waiter, bottle of wine, please. Oh, well, I just love wine. Do you, Mr. Franklin? Well, uh, yes. Bubbly wine? Yes. In big bottles? Yes. Oh, Mr. Franklin, we have so much in common. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Herbert. Herbert, let's sing the girls our old school song. Hey, huh? that's a good idea. Yeah, come on, come on, everybody sing. Well, you start it. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> Royal sons of old state, you, you are always right. So, on you go, on down the field, fight, 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 fight. Who's there? It's me, Walter. Oh. Oh, Walter. Wait a minute, Walter. Good morning, Walter. Good morning. Come on in. Well, how do you feel, Herbert? Awful. Just awful. Well, then you better sit down, Herbert. I... I have some upsetting news for you. What is it? How much do you remember about last night? Not too much. Yeah, I was afraid of that. What do you mean? Herbert, you're in trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, last night when we were celebrating our victory, we, we met two young ladies. I remember that. And you remember that we bought them a couple of bottles of wine downstairs in the lounge. I remember that perfectly. We sang some songs. That's right. Then you insisted on leaving here and going over to Pete's Tavern. I used to go there when I was a student. Yeah, I know, I know. So we went there and we had some more wine. Then about 10.30, you and the girl called Faye got up and said you were going someplace with her and that you'd meet us later. Did you let me go? Well, sure, sure. You look sober to me. Well, in a couple of hours, Herb, you, you came back. The two of you were giggling like school kids, and you told Grace and me you had gotten married. What? Well, that's what you said. Oh, oh at the time, I just laughed it off. Well, hey, it was a joke. Yeah, that's what I thought. But this morning I got to worrying about it, and I checked with the Justice of the Peace you mentioned and the town hall. Well? I'm sorry to tell you this, Herbert, but you really did get married last night. I couldn't have. Oh, believe me, you did. Oh, heaven, Walter. What am I going to do? Well, I've been thinking about that, Herbert. Maybe, maybe there's some way of buying people off. Let me investigate, and, and you wait right here until you hear from me. Meanwhile, in a nearby city in the FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated with his fellow agent Carl Putnam discussing a new case to which they have both been assigned. I'm sorry I had to call you away from the family on a Sunday, Carl, but the boss wanted you to work with me on this. That's all right, Jim. What's it about? Well, I don't know whether you remember a circular some time ago about a trio of swindlers, two women and a man. No, I don't. Who are they? Well, the names are Grace Carter, Faye Madison, and Walter Robertson. I see. What's a swindle? Well, in the past, we've wanted them because Robertson was marrying these girls off to servicemen and then taking their allotment checks. Well, that must have been some time ago, Jim. Yes, it was. That racket stopped with VJ Day. But then, two months ago, the same trio changed their pattern. Oh? What did they switch to? An old racket. They found a wealthy married man, took him out, got him drunk, and then in the morning, they told him that he had married one of the girls. What's their angle? 
Well, the married man naturally can't afford to have that become known, so Robertson acts as a go-between and buys off the girl. And Robertson also acts as if he doesn't know the girl. And somebody actually fell for that swindle? A man named Stewart in New Orleans just two months ago. Well, if it worked, how did we find out about it? Well, after thinking it over, Stewart decided that he'd been clipped, so he came into the New Orleans office. They sent out the circular on it. But you said all this happened two months ago. What's mm. the rush now? Well, New Orleans got a tip that they hid out down there and just headed up this way last week. Oh, I see. Well, what's the first step, Jim? I've already taken care of it, Carl. The police have been alerted, and they're checking all hotels and rooming houses in the city. Uh, look, while we're waiting for them to call back, why don't you take the records on this trio and study them, huh? Okay. I'll check with you as soon as I hear from the police. <laughs> Where's, uh, where's Faye? Down having breakfast. Well, how do you feel? Awful. Have you seen Franklin? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just came from their dreamboat, and there's good news tonight. He paid off? Please, Tempo. I haven't asked him for any money yet. Why not? I told him I was coming over to see Faye to find out whether I could make a deal for him. Did he remember anything about last night? <laughs> remember anything? <laughs> From the amount of stuff you put in his last drink, it's a wonder he even woke up. I had to do something the way you were going. What do you mean? You got that wine in you and almost killed the whole deal. How? You told Franklin that he shouldn't marry Faye, that he was too good for her. I don't believe you. Look, you got plastered and you pulled the same thing in Pittsburgh, remember? I in Shut Pittsburgh. Up. When are you going back to see that guy? I told him I'd return in a half an hour. How much are you asking him for? Ten thousand. That's too much. But he's loaded with dough. That means nothing. I cased the guy last night. For ten G's, he'd rather be a bigamist. But, Grace, I... Ask him for five. He'll go for that much. And when you collect, bring the dough right back here to Mama. Well, Carl, I located Robertson and his female accomplices. Good work, Jim. No, not too good. They were at the Central Hotel, but they've checked out. I see. I don't suppose they left any forwarding address. No, none at all. Did you check with the local hotel accounting department? Yes, most of the charges on their bill were from the cocktail lounge. I'm looking for a sucker, I suppose. I don't think so, Carl. I learned that he spent most of his time there with the piano player. An entertainer? Yes, I spoke to him. He told me that Robertson had staked him pretty well to teach him the state university songs. What would he want to know those for? I think I found the answer in this morning's paper. Oh, what is it? There's a story on the sports page about state winning its homecoming game, 7-6. Do you think Robertson was there? I'm sure he was, and probably as an old grad. We'd better alert the police up there at once. Come in. Hello, Herbert. Hello, Walter. Well, are you feeling any better, old-timer? Frankly, no. <laughs> well, I got some news that should cheer you up. It's about your marriage. Oh? Yeah. I've been doing lots of running around trying to fix up things, you know. My first stop was to see the Justice of the Peace, the one who married you. Yeah? <laughs> uh, I had to do a big sales job on him, and he finally agreed to do business for $500. What do you mean, business? Well, you know, forget that he ever married you. Oh. Yeah, then, then I went to see the man at the town hall who issued the license, and for another $500, he'll forget all about the license. Walter, I'm sorry you went to all that trouble. Ha <laughs> ha, it's no trouble at all. We're old schoolmates, aren't we? I did it for good old state. I know, and I appreciate it, but... But what? I wish you hadn't done it. <laughs> Why not? Well, since you told me all about what happened, I've been sitting here thinking. Yeah? Mostly, I was thinking about Faye. What a... Ah, what a pretty girl she is. Herb, what's your point? Well, I've decided that I want to stay married to her. Uh, you, you what? I want to stay married to Faye. But, but, but you can't. Why not? Well, uh, that, that's obvious, isn't it? Well, what are you talking about? Emma and the kids, you showed me their picture, remember? You'll be arrested for bigamy. But, Walter, they're not my children. They're Emma's children. I just helped to raise them. What about Emma? Well, she'll be mad, I suppose. But she'll get over it. Get over it? Your wife will get over it? Wife? Emma's my sister. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50-second interview on group insurance with a man from Boston. 
that... What are you going to name the new baby girl of yours, eh? Mary Ellen Ryan, Mr. Keating, after her mother. But we really ought to name her Equitable Ryan. Equitable Ryan? <laughs> yes, sir. Our company has complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. And my group insurance is going to pay all the bills for Mary Ellen. Hospitals and doctor bills both? That's right. Before we had complete group insurance, my first two kids each put me in debt. But this time... We own our baby, free and clear. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society is a mighty good thing for you, Pat. And it's just as good for your company. For three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yep. Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnovers. Mm, right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at, for lower cost and he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, I do better work now that I've got rid of worries about sickness and accidents and my wife and kids' future. Pat, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York Home Office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Gullible Groom. There is no telling with any degree of accuracy how much money confidence men have cost the American people in the past year. But despite the absence of any official records, it is safe to say that the amount runs into millions. And yet, as illustrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, there is no reason why these swindlers should be as successful as they are. There is one weapon at your disposal with which they can be stopped. And this goes for any swindler. That weapon and your FBI ask you to use it whenever you're approached with any kind of a proposition by anyone who is at all a stranger to you. That weapon with which every one of you is armed is common sense. The night's file continues in a hotel room in the college town. Walter Robertson has just finished explaining his failure to his two female accomplices. So that's what happened. Instead of being his wife, this Emma, he kept talking about is his sister. That's just great. Now, look, don't start hopping on me. It's bad enough as it is. Walter. What is it, Faye? I don't understand how he could be married to his sister. That's bigamy. Oh, honey, honey, just keep out of this, will you? What made you think this Emma was his wife? He showed me a picture, said it was Emma and his kids. Walter, if he's not married, he couldn't have kids. I know, Faye, I know. That's bigamy, too. Now, please shut up and let me figure a way out of this. You shut up, too. I'll do the figuring from now on. What am I, stupid? Now that you brought it up? Yes. Uh... You've run this show long enough. It's my turn now. Okay, Mrs. Genius. Now listen to me, both of you. Faith, this Franklin guy wants to stay married to you. Okay, let him have his way. But, Grace, we're not married. How can we stay married if we're not married in the first place? I know you're not married. But go along with the game. He wants to take Faye back to Aurora with him. When? On the train in a half an hour. You can make it. You're all packed. Sure, I'm packed. But don't I have anything to say about this? Who wants to live in Aurora? Faye, you go with him. The whole trip only takes two hours. Walter and I'll be on the same train, and we'll see you in Aurora. <laughs> Jim. Oh, hello, Carl. I've checked the other two hotels. Robertson didn't... Robertson register. stayed here, Carl, but he checked out by the time the police made their call. I see. Any idea where he went? To a town called Aurora. That's about two hours from here. It's also across the state line. Yes, I know. How did you find out they went there? The transportation desk got two tickets for Robertson on the two o'clock train. He's there by now. Should be. I've already alerted the Aurora police to check all the hotels and rooming houses every hour. You think there's anything else to do here before we go to Aurora? Yes. Now, look, Robertson must have gone to Aurora to follow a victim. That's logical. It isn't the kind of a town he'd pick to live in. All right, that's point one. Point two is the victim must be an old grad who was back here for the homecoming game. Right. Point three is that the old grad must be married because that's Robertson's pattern. How does knowing all that help us? I'm going over to the alumni office and get a list of the married alumni who live in Aurora. <laughs> 
I hope you find somebody at the office. It's Sunday, you know. Oh, I've already gotten the alumni association secretary on the phone. He's going to meet me at his office in ten minutes. Good. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, look, Robertson's room hasn't been cleaned since he checked out. The manager will give you a pass key. So, Carl, why don't you go up there and see if you can find him? Okay, where will I meet you? When you're finished, come over to the alumni office. I'll wait for you there. sure this is a place you told Faye to meet us? Certainly, I'm sure. How many cocktail bars do you think there are in this town? I don't know, and I don't care. Oh, there she is. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello, Faye. How was the trip? Oh, it was just fine. We had lunch on the train, and he bought me some magazines with pictures in them and some candy. Oh, never mind that. What kind of a joint does he live in? Well, it looks like one of those castles in fairy tales. I never saw a place so big in my whole life. <laughs> I knew the guy was loaded. He hasn't paid off yet. But you've got a way to make him pay off, remember? That's right. And here it is. You're going to call Herbert in a couple of minutes and tell him we just got into town. Tell him you've got to see him. Why? Tell him you spoke to the Justice of Peace and the guy in the town hall again. And that they're going to give the whole story about the marriage and the attempted bribery to the papers. Implicating Herbert in the bribe, too? Right. Then you tell him that they're both waiting for a call from you. And that for 5000 you can chill the beef. Well, <laughs> not bad. Thanks. Faye, he'll undoubtedly talk to you about this. You advise him to pay. Then we come over and pick up the 5000 Grace. What? I don't want to do it. Huh? huh? I, I don't want to do that. Herbert's been very nice to me, and I'd like to stay married to him. Listen, lame brain. You forget you're not married to this guy. He only thinks you are. Oh, that's right. Look, you just go back home and keep Herbert there till he gets our phone call. <laughs> Alumni Association's office? Carl. Carl, I'm in here. Oh, fine. Any luck yet, Jim? I spoke to the police at Aurora a couple of times since I saw you. What did they say? They've checked every hotel and rooming house twice now, and still no sign of any of the trio. I don't understand that. No. The transportation desk at that hotel said definitely that Robertson bought tickets to Aurora. Yeah, so they did. You know, he might be staying at the home of the victim. I never thought of that. How about the alumni records? Well, I've come up with 45 alumni who live in Aurora who are married. That's not too many. We ought to be able to comb through them in time to stop Robertson. Carl, I'm afraid we've made a mistake someplace along the line. Why? I phoned the list of the police in Aurora and had them contact every one of the names. And none of them was the right one? None of them had ever even heard of Robertson or the girls. Uh, how do you figure that, Jim? Well, we must have made a mistake. What do we do now? We retrace our steps and see where we went wrong. Well, where do you want to start? Uh, look, before we do that, let's go over your stuff. Now, what did you find in Robertson's room? Well, nothing very much, I'm afraid. This football program, for one thing. Any writing on any of the pages? No, I checked through every inch of space. Okay, what else? This red feather that I suppose Robertson wore in his hat yesterday. No, that's no help. And this banner that he probably waved as he sang the state alma mater. Mm, with tears in his eyes. Yeah. And then in the waste paper basket, there was this ticket stub. I guess that's where he sat for the game. Let me see that, huh? Yeah. There's a red A printed on it. That means it was in the alumni section. And that also means that that ticket was sold to an alumnus through this office. But Robertson's no alumnus. How did he get this kind of a ticket? I don't know, but I think we can find out. Come on. I hope Faye kept Franklin at home. Of course she did. She's not that stupid. Don't underestimate that girl. Well, hello there, Herbert. Oh, hello, Walter. You uh, remember Miss Carter, don't you? Oh, yes, of course. Hello, Miss Carter. Hello, Herbert. Okay, come in, both of you. Well, thanks, thanks. Go ahead, honey. Who's that, Herbert? It's Grace and Walter. Oh, hello there. <laughs> it's been such a long time since I've seen you. Uh, Herbert, I want you to know how awful we feel about this shakedown you're getting. Oh, well, thank you. Have uh, <clears throat> have you got the money, Herbert? Yeah, yes, I have it right here. Good, good. I certainly appreciate your taking care of this for me. <laughs> Think nothing of it, old man. Are there any other steps I should take? Oh, no, 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 no. I'll handle the whole thing so that no one will know about the marriage until you get ready to announce it yourself. Oh, thank you. Uh, Herbert, I think Faye had better come back to town with us, just, uh, so nobody sees her around here and starts to talk. Well, uh, that's probably a good idea. Faye, uh, 
I'm sorry that you have to start your married life off this way. Oh, that's all right, Herbert. This isn't the first... Uh, we'd better be going. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, go ahead, honey. You run along with them. I'll talk to you in the morning. All right, dear. Well, come along, girls. Good night, Herbert. Step back, Robertson. Oh, what? I said step back in there. You and the girls, too. What is this? Yeah. Looks like we arrived here just at the right time. Who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. Are you Mr. Franklin? Yes. Why are you here? To arrest this trio of swindlers. Wait, Faye's not a swindler. She's my wife. Mr. Franklin, that makes you a member of a very large club. However, I seriously doubt that you are married. We can check that, though, when these people are booked in jail. <laughs> Waldo Robertson was tried in federal court and was sentenced to serve five years in prison in violation of the National Stolen Property Act. His two female accomplices were also convicted and sentenced to terms of 18 months. And so your FBI captured three criminals for whom it had been searching a long time and captured them because of one single slim clue. That clue was the stub of the football ticket found in the hotel room. Alumni Association records showed that the ticket had been sold to Herbert Franklin and it was at his home that the arrests were made. Thus, once again, your FBI showed that one way to help curb the crime wave is to follow every clue, however meager it appears, to its conclusion. That is a part of the training given to every special agent before he becomes an accredited member of the agency which serves every one of the 140 million Americans from coast to coast. Your national law enforcement agency, your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For instance, the president of General Tire and Rubber Company, Mr. William O'Neill, says, We believe that group protection has made our employees happier by freeing them from some of the major worries of life and has thereby helped to improve the morale of our organization. This protection is one of the strongest ties that a man and his family can have with the company that employs him, and it comes to him on such easy terms. If your company does not have group insurance or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case in the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that dramatizes the pursuit of an innocent fugitive by a relentless killer. Its subject, Mob Vengeance. Its title, The Runaway Dancer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. And Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Runaway Dancer on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Now let me read a telegram to the Equitable Life Assurance Society from St. Louis. I quote, Dear Equitable, at discussion group meeting last Wednesday, 
your Equitable Society commercials were voted best on the air. No high-pressure selling, lots of facts and helpful information. Keep it up. Well, we are. Tonight's Equitable Society commercial will deal with a type of insurance that's important in the lives of one out of every three Americans. Yet most of you people who have it know almost nothing about it. So listen carefully in just 14 minutes to a message on group insurance from the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Tonight's FBI file, The Runaway Dancer. Your FBI makes periodic studies of the field of crime in an effort to be better prepared to apprehend every criminal possible. And from each of those studies, certain facts are deduced. One of those facts is that there are no two criminals exactly alike, even as there are no two decent law-abiding citizens who are exactly alike. Yet there is at least one common characteristic among all criminals who commit crimes as a business, who try to make their living by stealing, lying, cheating, or killing. That common denominator is brutality. Brutality born of the constant effort to take what rightfully belongs to someone else. Brutality which has always accompanied every evidence of the lust that helps make some men criminals. The consuming lust for power. The night's file opens in a shabby second floor dance hall located in a large western city. It is early evening. One of the hostesses is seated at a corner table as another hostess approaches. Hi, Sally. Oh, hello, Peg. Oh, if I sit here a minute. Oh, my feet are chilling me. Oh, that's a shame. How many tickets you got so far, kid? Three. Oh. Look, honey, do you mind if I tell you something? No. You're brand new here, and I've been at this thing a long time. Oh, I, I feel entitled to give you a little advice. I wish you would. Honey, you don't spell enough. Spell? Yeah. Laugh, talk, turn it on. But, Peg, I try. Sweetheart, nothing comes out. Well, what do you suggest I do? I mean... What should I laugh and talk about? You talk about him. That's all the guys are ever interested in. Oh, you butter him up, you laugh at his jokes, and you don't look so sad. You just got to remember, there'll always be nights like this. <laughs> well, I... Now, you wait. Here comes a guy now. Turn on the charm and you nail him. No, no, you dance with him, Peg. Ah, none of that. Stand up there and let me see you go to work. Come on, come on, get up. Well, I... I... Go on, talk to him. Uh, hello there. You want to dance? Oh, sure. Now, here's a ticket for one. Excuse me, Peg. By all means. My, but you're an awfully good dancer. Uh -huh. <laughs> you just seem to have so much rhythm, don't you? Yeah. Uh, do you come up here often? I certainly hope so. You, you just dance so wonderfully. There's another I'm... way out of here. Huh? Is there any way to get out besides from them front steps? Oh, yes, the forest gate. Where is it? Right behind those curtains in the back. We'll dance over there. Why? Please, just do as I say. You, you want to leave? That's right. But we just started dancing. Well, I... just let me. What? You're hurt. It's nothing. Your, your shoulder is bleeding. Is this where the door is? Yes, but I, I. Take the rest of my tickets. Just let me go out. And do me a favor, will you? Forget you ever saw me. Wait. Huh? That shoulder. I, I can't let you. Look, I'm coming with you. The following morning in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just greeting his fellow agent, Pat Walsh. Hello, Pat. Welcome back. Oh, thanks, Jim. How was the vacation? Great. Well, good. Oh, you've been in to see the boss yet? Yes, that's what I'm doing here. He wants me to work with you. Fine. Fine, I can use the help. Well, what's the story? A bank job. Four men held up the Travers National. Well, how'd they work? Well, one man went into the bank and did the actual job... Two others stood guard outside, and the fourth man stayed in the car. Any identification? Tell her at the bank saw the one who did the actual stick-up. No mask? Oh, yes. He had a handkerchief over his face. They got a coughing spell, and it slipped. 
fellow is downstairs now, going over our file of pictures. Any uh, dent on the others? No. You know, there's one thing about this holdup that puzzles me, though. Oh, what's that? Well, the bank is on a corner. The getaway car was parked right in front of it on Main Street. Yes. Yeah. Now, when the bandit ran out of the bank, he didn't make for the car. Instead, he turned the corner onto 3rd Avenue and ran into the railroad station. Well, what happened then? According to a few of the eyewitnesses, one of the men in the gang ran after him, but he got away. The other two drove off in the car. That is odd. Did anybody think to get the license number of the car they used? Yes. Yes, the car turned up abandoned this morning. How much did they get? 18000 Excuse me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes, Jack. He did? Belmont, huh? Yeah, fine. Thanks very much. That was the ident section. Teller just definitely identified a thief named Belmont as the man who did the job. Well, that's a break. They're sending us up Belmont's record. As soon as it gets here, we go to work. any better? Who are you? Sally. Sally? Oh, the girl from the dance hall. Yes, that's right. Where am I? <laughs> well, this is my place. I brought you here last night. I sure I, I bathed it and I put a bandage on. He made me promise not to call a doctor. Did you call one? No. Oh, thanks. Well, can you eat something? No. Not just yet. I've got to be getting to work soon. What time is it? Almost six. At night? Yes. Uh, really, Bernard? Uh, wait a minute. What do you knock yourself out for? What do you mean? Bringing me here. You needed help. I can't pay you nothing. I didn't expect nothing. I'm sorry. I... I know what it is to... It to be alone and need somebody to help you. I suppose you've been wondering what this is all about. Why I got shot. I didn't ask you, did I? No. And there's some guys who want to get their hands on me. Gangsters? Yeah, I guess you'd call them that. Well, why don't you call the police? I can't. Why not? They'd help you. I'll explain some other time. You'd better get some more sleep. Are you leaving? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to work. Sally, huh? I'm going to ask you one more favor. Would you call the place I work? I'll give you the number. Tell them I won't be in. Sure, but I... But what? You never told me your name. Oh, it's Belmont. Tommy Belmont. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Anything happened while I was out? Uh, Bill called. He went out and examined the car that was used in the bank job, but he couldn't find a thing. Oh? Any news from the police? Uh -huh. How'd you make out? Well, I finally found the hotel where Belmont was living. Was living? Yes, he checked out the morning of the stick-up. One of the bellboys said that he took Belmont's bags down to the railroad station and checked them, but Belmont never came back for the claim checks. Oh, that's funny. I got the claim checks and went down to the station. The bags were still there. Did you go through them? Yes, but there wasn't anything in them that might be a lead... There's some shirts and socks and two old suits. Hmm, sounds like he intended to come back for the checks, but never got a chance. Yeah, I guess that must be it. He must have just grabbed the train when he ran into the railroad station. But did he have any friends at the hotel? No. No, he was a loner. But the clerk told me he was sick a lot, that he used a house doctor. Did you get to see him? Yes, he told me that Belmont has quite a bad case of tuberculosis. Yeah, it would explain the fit of coughing during the stick-up. Yes, it explains that, but it doesn't explain why he didn't use the getaway car. No. Jim? Hmm? I'm convinced of one thing. He ran into that railroad station on purpose. It wasn't just the first safe place. Yeah, I'm inclined to go along with you on that. I've got the switchboard working now on something that might prove you to be right. What's that? The doctor at the hotel told Belmont to go away to a sanitarium up in the mountains. Any particular one? No, I gave him a list of places I got. No oh, pardon me. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. Oh, yes? Oh, yes. Yes, thanks very much. Now, look, will you will you put a call through the police headquarters up there for me? No. That's fine. Thanks. That was the switchboard, Pat. They were working on that list. They've located Belmont at one of the sanitariums. Good. You hold down the office. I'm going to take a run up there right now. Sally. Huh? 
What happened to you last night? Why, I, I went home. And what happened to that tall kid you were dancing with? Who? The tall kid, your last customer. Oh, oh, he, he didn't feel good. He, he needed some fresh air. So you went out the back door with him and down the fire escape. So how do you know? I saw you. Oh. Oh, look, Sally, I don't want to run your life, but be careful. Oh. What do you mean? That tall kid is red hot. I don't understand, Pig. There was a guy in here last night right after you two left. He was looking for him. Huh? No. A hoodlum. And he's here again tonight. Where? He's walking toward us right now. In the brown suit? Yeah. Hey, what'll I do? Too late for anything now, honey. I got some tickets here. I want to dance. With me, honey. No, honey. With her. But she's kind of tired. Shut up. Come on, sister. But I... I dance, I said. That's it. My, but you're an awfully good dancer. You, you just seem to have so much rhythm. Stop the routine. Where's Tommy Delmont? Who? The guy you took out of here the back way last night. I don't know what you're talking about. You took him out of here. He didn't go home, so he must have gone to your place. Where do you live? That's none of your business. Look, you'd better answer me. I don't have to. I don't have to dance with you either. Find yourself another girl. <laughs> Is that you, Sally? Yes, sir. Isn't this pretty early for you to be home? Yes. You didn't get fired on account of me, did you? No, Tony, no. I came home because... because you're in trouble. Well, what do you mean? A man came up to the dance hall. He was looking for you. What was his name? I don't know. He danced with me and he asked me where you were. What did you tell him? I said I didn't know. Oh, what did he look like? He's short with, with black hair and a mustache. And a scar on his right cheek? Yes, that's right. Marty Stokes. The guy who shot me. Well, what does he want? Nothing. I don't want to get you in trouble. I, I got to get out of here. Look, you can't get out of bed. You're too weak. Tommy. What? Please let me call the police. No. But he'll kill you. I know he will. Let me take care of myself. They shot you once. They'll kill you the next time. Please, Tommy. Honey, there's an awful good reason why I can't. But you... you... Look. I, I got a brother. He's older than me. His name's Frank. He's been in trouble ever since I can remember. Trouble? With the cops. Last week, three of his gang held up a bank. What? Yeah, they held up a bank. Frank found out the other three guys were going to double-cross him, so he beat them to it and ran away with the loot. Were you mixed up in it? No. They came to my house and talked to my landlady. She told him I'd gotten a phone call from my brother. Well, how did she know? The phone's in the hall, she answered. These guys want to know where Frank went with the money. I'm not going to tell him. Tommy, I think it's swear you're that nice to your brother, but if it means getting killed, Sally, I... Sally, I... Frank is sick. So sick, he's only got about six months to live. That's why I can't go to the cops. I have to tell him where he is. I don't want him to spend his last few months in any prison. I understand. Tommy, what are you going to do? Well, one thing I got to do for sure... To get out of here. But you're safe here. You don't know that mob. They'll find out where you live. We've already found out, Tommy. Marty. How did you get here? I followed you. Now get out of my way, sister. <laughs> okay, Tommy. Start talking. <laughs> Return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, a 50 second interview on group insurance with a man in his 60s who is just about to have himself a vacation in Florida. Andy, how soon do you expect to get back to work? I'm never coming back to work, Mr. Keating. This vacation is going to last for the rest of my life. Well, you must have saved a lot of money to be able to retire these days. We saved what we could. But what really fixed things up for my wife and me was my company's complete group insurance with the Equitable Society. That included a pension plan, too? That's right. Every month, as long as I live, the postman's going to hand me a check from the Equitable Society. Yes, group insurance with the Equitable Society was a mighty good thing for you, Andy. And it's just as good for your company. For three good reasons. First, it means satisfied, loyal workers. Yep. 
Think of getting life insurance, accident and sickness insurance, and retirement income, plus hospital, surgical, and medical benefits, all in one package from the Equitable Society, without any medical examination. Second, group insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society decreases labor turnover. Right. A fellow thinks twice before he walks out on a job which gives him extra insurance coverage at far lower cost than he could buy it as an individual. Third, Equitable Society group insurance improves quality and quantity of production. Believe me, a man does better work when he's rid of all those worries about sickness and accidents and his wife and kids' future. Andy, I hope every employer in this radio audience hears what you've said and that every one of them is resolving now to get the facts on complete group insurance protection from an Equitable Society expert. Get in touch with the nearest office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. Or write direct to the New York home office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Runaway Dancer. Occasionally, there are extenuating circumstances which tempt a decent, right-thinking citizen either to consort with criminals or to shield a criminal by hiding something from the police. When that happens, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, that citizen thinks he is doing the right thing by following the dictates of his conscience. But in every case, and there are no exceptions, he is not only doing the wrong thing, but he is endangering himself. If a situation should ever arise in your life where you have some information which would help to solve a crime, even though it compromises someone near to you, there is only one step you can take, only one thing you can do which will be to your ultimate advantage. Call your local police. Tonight's file continues in the FBI field office. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just returned from a visit to the sanitarium and is relaying his information to his fellow agent, Pat Walsh. Jim, did you find Belmont? Yes. Well, where is he? He's still at the sanitarium under protective custody. I see. What did you get from him? He admitted taking part in the stick-up. I brought back his written confession. It's in on the boss's desk now. How much did he tell you? Everything. Including the names of his accomplices? Yes, he named the three others who worked on the job with him. I sent out alarms on all three. Isn't it kind of odd that Belmont talked so freely, Jim? He had a reason for talking. Well, what's that? He says that he found out the gang was going to double-cross him. So he decided to double-cross them instead and run away with the loot. Uh -huh. This morning, he just received word that the other three hoodlums are gunning for his kid brother and may kill him if he doesn't tell them where he's hiding. Well, that might be the truth, and then again, it might not. I think it might be for one reason, Pat. Belmont still has that money someplace, and he offered to make us a deal. Well, what kind of a deal? Well, we've got him, but we haven't got the money. He says that if we capture the other three and in that way remove his kid brother from any danger, he'll turn in the money. So our job now is to find the other three Confederates and Belmont's brother. That's it. And if Belmont's story is true, we'd better hurry. Tommy. What is it? You know I'm a nice fella. I don't like to hurt nobody. But I may have to start if you don't open up soon and tell me where your brother is. He has been telling you. He doesn't know. You keep out of this. He's right. I don't know where Frank is. Okay, kid. Let's forget about where he is. Make believe I'm not interested. We'll change the subject. Okay? Fine. Suppose you just tell me where he stashed the dough. I don't know that either. Look, Tommy. Believe me, if it was just me... I'd walk out of here and forget the whole thing. Then why don't you? What would I tell my partners? That I came here, you told me a story, that I was a big slob and said forget it. They wouldn't understand, kid. No? No. So why don't you make it easy for both of us? Tell me where we can find Frank, or the dough, and let me get out of here. The hundredth time, I don't know. Look, kid, I never belted anybody who was laying in bed. Don't make me break my record. You leave him alone. You hear what I'm saying, Tommy? I hear you. This is your last chance. Where's your brother? I don't know. Okay. I guess you gotta get the full treatment. <laughs> Jim, would you 
just got a phone call from police headquarters. On that alarm we sent out? Yes, they pulled a surprise raid and arrested two of the three men who worked with Belmont. Good. Now, which one is missing? Marty Stokes. Stokes, I know him. He's a killer. How about you? Do you have any luck? Yes, when I left here, I went up to the rooming house where Tommy Belmont lived. Mm-hmm. Anybody home? I spoke to his landlady. She told me Tommy hadn't been home last night at all. Well, sounds like Frank's story might be true. Know. Did you know where he works? Yes, in a garage on 11th Street. I went over there. Any luck? Well, I spoke to the garage manager. He said that he received a phone call earlier tonight about Tommy. Who called? What did he say? It was a she. She said that Tommy was sick and he wouldn't begin to work. Well, did he get her name? Just a first name. It was Sally. Well, that's not much help. No, but the manager remembered that she said she worked at the Rainbow Ballroom. On Main Street? Yes, that's the place. I called them. They have a hostess named Sally, but she wasn't there. Pat, I think we should go over to the Rainbow Ballroom. Pardon me, are you Miss Peg Jackson? Yeah. We're special agents of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What do you want? We'd like to ask you a few questions about your girlfriend, Sally Adams. What about Sally? What's happened to her? Nothing, we hope. No riddles, mister. Well, from what the manager says, Miss Adams just came to work here last week. That's right. And he says that because you girls get paid on the 1st and the 15th of the month, well, he still hasn't gotten her address. Well? Well, Miss Jackson, since you seem to be the only friend she had up here, we thought that you might know her address. You came to the wrong store, Mr. Taylor. I don't turn in my friends. We don't want to arrest Miss Adams, but she might be in very serious danger. We'd like to help her. Are you leveling? We have absolutely no reason to want to arrest Miss Adams. You can take our word for that. Okay. What do you want to know? Where does she live? I don't know. I went there last Thursday night with her after work, but we went in the cab and we were talking all the way. You know the way it is. You don't pay much attention. Yes, I understand. Do you remember anything about the house? Mm, yeah, it was number 333. But I don't know what street it was on because there was so much excitement. Oh, about what? There was a big fire right across the street. Miss Jackson, can you remember what kind of building was on fire? I think it was a store. Why? We may be able to check the fire department records and see what fires they covered on Thursday night. Oh, I see. Miss Jackson, did you take the cab to Miss Adams' home from here in front of the dance hall? Yeah, we did. Now, this is very important. Do you remember how much the cab fare was? Um, let's see. I paid it. Uh, the meter read 60 cents. Well, that means it's less than two miles from here. Pat, let's get a map of the city and check with the fire department on what fires they covered within a radius of two miles of here last Thursday night. Okay, Jim. A fire across the street from a building numbered 333 ought to give us Sally Adams' address. <laughs> Tommy. Tommy. All right, break it up, break it up. <laughs> Get away from the guy. It's time I went back to work. No, you can't hit him anymore. He's unconscious now. I just want to bring him to... No! Shh! Look. I told you before about that screaming. If anybody comes in here, your boyfriend never gets off that bed. Now, get away. Don't hit him anymore, please. I ain't going to hit him. I give you my word. All right, Tommy. Come around. Come on. Is that water in that glass? Yes. Give me. Here. All right, Tommy. What? Come on. What? What? That's it. What is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Look, I ain't working out on you anymore, kid. Do you hear that? Yeah. I got a better way to get my information. I'm using your girlfriend here. Huh? Yeah. Let me lift you up a minute. <clears throat> there. I want you to have a ringside seat for the main attraction. Leave her alone, Marty. Come here, sweetheart. No, let go of me. Now watch this, Tommy. And this will keep up till you decide to do business. You want her to take any more? Taking enough, Stokes. Uh, who are you? From the FBI. Oh. Uh, Jim, he's taking a break. Oh, no, he isn't. Well, thanks, Stokes. Thanks for trying to get away. Mister, you're, you're not going to arrest Tommy. Oh, no, Miss Adams. You take care of Tommy. We'll take care of Stokes. <laughs> Marty Stokes was given a 25-year sentence in federal prison for bank robbery. 
The other members of his gang were sentenced to 15 years each for their part in the crime. And thus, by careful deduction and painstaking investigation, your FBI was able not only to round up the four criminals who wantonly robbed a bank, but also to save two young innocent people from further sadistic torture meted out by a brutal thug. In this case, as in so many others, time was an all-important factor. And for that reason, the special agents assigned to this case worked through the night. Criminals have no office hours. And, as many of them have learned to their regret, neither does your FBI. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, some more useful facts on Equitable Society Group Insurance. It's a bargain for workers because it enables the company to give its employees the benefit of its wholesale purchasing power. It's a bargain for the management because it builds loyalty and goodwill, decreases personnel turnover, improves quality and quantity of production. For almost 20 years, we have provided our employees with group life, health, and accident insurance writes Mr. J.W. Glenn, president of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And we consider that this insurance, one of our many benefit plans, contributes greatly to the morale and security of our employees. If your company does not have group insurance, or if your group program is incomplete, get in touch immediately with the nearest office of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case involving crime on a tropical island. Its subject, jewel theft. Its title, The Flying Felon. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was Dean Carlton. And Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Flying Felon on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.